Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Buyer Conversion. Today we're going to master the buyer process, and I'm going to go ahead and play a quick intro, and um, that'll give everybody a minute to get logged in and set up, and we'll get on with the show. So let's get this started here. So welcome, welcome, and uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Um, where did my zoomy zoom zoom go? There it is. All right. So welcome to Buyer Conversion. I'm Michael Coburn, broker for Remax Town and Country, home of the best agents. And uh, today we're actually doing uh, some social distancing in office classroom training. Everybody, say hello. <laughs> Super, super excited to actually have people in the class while we're doing our training. So I've got a lot to talk about today. For those of you that are in the class, uh, we are going to get two hours of free MCE. For those of you on the webinar, you just get a great education. And so what does Samuel Johnson say? Samuel Johnson says, most people need to be reminded way more he doesn't say way more he says far more than they need to be instructed so in that sense i want to remind you guys of all the things you know what you should be doing and if you don't know this stuff then you will be instructed <laughs> but uh so anyways i'm gonna go ahead and get started we are also going to have a drawing we got a, a gift card here this one it's either $10, $20, or $50. I don't remember what it is. So, you know, whatever. Um, the other one is we've got a cheese board. So we're going to be doing that too. Did it work? Did it go away? All right. So just wanted to make sure the webinar is still going here. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with that. And uh, we are going to be recording this. So if you have uh, any questions, we uh, make sure you put those in the chat. And then we will come back to that as well. Jonathan, I'm glad to see you can make it. Um, and then also, also we are going to record this, like I said, so you can go back and re-watch it. So let's get on with the show. And here we go. All right. So getting the most out of this class. First of all, you have to be intentional, proactive every step of the way, right? And so you need to attend this class with an open mind, a willingness to learn, attend class expecting to and looking for ways to improve. Make a decision right now. Today, I'm going to learn something, right? Because if you get one, two, three good nuggets of gold out of this class, I guarantee it's going to improve your business and create more income. So eliminate all distractions. Be all in. Don't leave the room. And what do I mean by that? When you get on your phone, when you look at email, when you check in your texting, you're leaving the room. So eliminate the distractions and be all in. 
ask questions, be engaged. I know you guys on the webinar, it's a little, little bit more difficult to ask questions, but put those in there. And we do have Ann and Emily sitting up front today. They're gonna to be regularly checking those and they'll let me know if there's a question. Um, and then record your ahas. Your ahas are your great ideas. The great ideas that you have, put those in your aha journal because so many times, you know, I go to a seminar or a webinar or a class or something, I hear some great information, right? And I go, oh man, I'm gonna remember that. And about 30 minutes later, I go, hey, what was that he said about the thing about the thing? Yeah, no, write it down in your journal. All right, so what's your goal after training? Charlotte, what's the goal of training? To learn. To, learn. to, know. to know. To get better. To get better. Action, absolutely. The goal of training in this office is and always will be action. And that's called, you got to turn what you learn into action, okay? Now, you don't want to suffer the curse of knowledge. And that is thinking that you know it all, but then do none of it, right? So being the know-it-all, taking no action. We want you to learn here, and there's more to training than just the lecture, right? First of all, you got the training and you get the lecture, then you gotta take what you've heard, you're exposed to something for the first, second, third, 14th time, but you're exposed to something, and then you gotta take it back and you gotta study it, and then you gotta practice it, and then you go put it into action, okay? So remember, it's the doing of the activities that creates the perfecting of the activities. Nobody starts out perfect, okay? You have to go out and fail, and fail fast. The faster you fail, the faster you're going to succeed. So here's irrefutable fact number one, and that is real estate is a get rich business, right? We know that real estate is a get rich business. Who is it a get rich business for? Aaron says, me. <laughs> Sharon says, real estate agents. Who's good? Who is it? What? Emily is exactly right. It's those who intend to get rich. Real estate is a get rich business if you intend to. If you go into it unintentional, you're not gonna luck into getting rich. You have to be intentional and proactive. And what is intentional and proactive? Intentional is you gotta make a plan. So you got a plan and our plan is we wanna get rich if, if that's your plan, right? So if you plan to get rich and you put a plan in, in place to make that happen, now you gotta be proactive and that is follow the plan every single day and you got to be consistent and we're going to talk about being consistent it's one of the most important things you can do now did i tell you guys that this is a two-hour class okay i'm going to try and knock this out in an hour so bear with me get out your pen get ready i'm going to give you this stuff like i like to receive it and that is going to look like you're getting information through a fire hose so that's the, way, that's the way Sharon likes it too, right, Sharon? Here it is. There's two approaches to real estate. Two approaches to real estate. You could be a typical salesperson or a unique entrepreneur, right? Typical salesperson goes through the day like this. Their focus is getting through the day. Their method is the wing it, right? And the wing it is non-duplicatable. Their behavior is wish, wait, and hope. And what do I mean by that, right? Man, God, I wish I had a buyer. Maybe I'll wait here by the phone. It's your hope that it rings, right? That's the wish, wait, and hope behavior. The perspective is short term. Short term is got to get a deal now. Got to get a deal now. All I care about is now, 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 now. I don't care about planning and doing anything for the future. I just got to find a buyer and I got to get a deal now because I need a commission check because I like food with my meals, right? <laughs> and the belief is growth is painful. So they avoid discomfort. The typical salesperson avoids discomfort. They like living in their comfort zone and you've got to get out of that comfort zone. Um, and then the result is at the end of the day, one of two things you're gonna say, right? Either I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. The typical salesperson, which is a wish I had, I wish I had, right? And that's wage mentality. This is not a wage business, right? If you have wage mentality, and want to just work a 40 hour week or, a, or 30 or 40 hour week and collect a check every week or two weeks or every month, this is not the career for you. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at the unique entrepreneur. Their focus is on building a thriving business. 
The method is using effective systems because systems are duplicatable. The behavior is commit, act, and expect. If I make a commitment to do something and then act upon my commitments with micro commitments, I expect a return. That's just the way it works. Now your perspective is short term, mid term, and long term. I need a buyer now, but I'm going to prospect to do something for now, but I'm also going to do things mid term and I'm going to plan for the future. So I'm going to try to do all three of those things all the time because it's not all about now, 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 because you're going to be like a hamster in a cage always work in the now. And we'll talk about that when we talk about just generating cash flow and not generating a business. The growth for these people is a challenge, right? They invite discomfort. They want that challenge. Um, and the result is, I'm glad I did, right? You put in the work, you do all the work and hard effort. You have all those little failures that created the success. And then when it's over, you're like, ah, I'm glad I did. All right, so remember this, the, there's two approaches. You got the typical salesperson and everyone starts out as typical. The journey is to become unique. So everyone starts out as typical, so don't worry about it. The journey is to go from typical and progress to unique, okay? Now there are three priorities of real estate game. Who knows these three priorities? Anybody online? The three priorities of the real estate game are lead generation, lead conversion, and client servicing. That's it. Those are the three things you need to focus on every single day. Those are your priorities. If you have more than three priorities, you have none. So think about that in your business. All right, there's seven ambitions of a real estate agent. And when you're brand new, right, Hadish? It's all about consistently active. I just got to do something. I got to go do something. I got to put together my package. I got to go learn how to do the MLS. I got to find a buyer. I got to get a seller. I just, I'm just active, 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 doing everything, but you don't know if it's all the right things yet. You're just consistently active. Then you go to consistently vital. You move from doing relevant and irrelevant activities and sporadically vital and some dollar productive to now you're consistently vital, okay? Once you're consistently vital, you're gonna be making a whole heck of a lot more money. Now you figured that out, and the next level or ambition would be consistently dollar productive, okay? And consistently dollar productive is where you wanna to get to as soon as possible. And then you go consistently at your highest and best use. Your highest and best use, to give you an example, for me, my three priorities of my real estate business in my career were, I would prospect for listings, pitch a listing, and then negotiate contracts. Those are the only three things I had to do. I had somebody else to do everything else. Now, at the reason I'm telling you that is because consistently at your highest and best use, that's where I was. I was at a level four because I knew nobody on my team could prospect for listings better than me on the phone or knocking on doors. I knew nobody was better at the listing conversation than I was. So I did that. I'm operating in my highest and best use. Those are the things I did the best and negotiated the contracts. Everything else gets what? Delegated, okay? But when you're new, you do it all. Because I always say, when you don't have an assistant, you are one, right? And then you go to consistently the activity most enjoy. That's the level I'm at in my career right now. This is what I love to do. I love to sit here and help you guys train, coach, develop to get you guys to any level you want. And once you go from this level, you go to consistently away. I'm not, a, I'm not about being away. I want to be down in the thick of things on the front lines going, yeah, let's go do it, right? So I'm not about that in my life yet. There may come a day where I'm like, you know what? This sucks. I'm going to Jamaica, right? <laughs> but and then, yeah, I do enough of that already. And then it's world domination, right? World domination. I mean, if you want world domination, you can have it if you follow the plan, okay? So let's move on. Here's operating at your highest and best use. This is the dollar productive food chain, okay? Karen, what's the most important thing in your career right now? What are you striving to have every single day? Closings. We want closings. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you. But our highest and best use is, let me look, point it out this way. If I got a closing that I can go to today, or 
I can go to a training class. What am I going to go do? I'm going to a closing. Why? Because that's where the money is. So that's right. So it's our highest and best use. It's the number one thing. So when we're looking at our calendar, we want to look. What's our highest and best use? Closings. Do I have any closings coming up today? Well, no. Do I have any this week or this month? If so, schedule them and move on to the next dollar productive activity. Now you're looking at transactions. I got deals I need to hold together to make sure I have a closing. I've got negotiating offers or taking listings or writing offers for my buyers, okay? That's the next level of dollar productive things. So once I've scheduled and done all the things I could possibly do in those four categories, then I'm moving down to what? Presentations. Do I have listings, presentations that I can go get, give to try to get a listing? Or do I got an A buyer in the car that I wanna go write up an offer for to get him in contract so he can be in, uh, in title so we can have a closing down the road. Now, once I've done those three things, it's all about this. Prospect, 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 right? How's everybody's business right now? Does everybody got all the business they could possibly handle? So you guys want more business? Let me ask you this. How many note cards did you write today? How many people did you call today? How many past clients did you call? How many current clients did you call, right? What have you done today to get to the business that you want? I know you're saying, Michael, but it's only 1030. I just got up at 10 o'clock, right? No, <laughs> but so you have to think about this. You have to ask yourself this question. Am I doing everything possible every day to get as much business as I could possibly get? Am I doing what it takes? Because I've had a lot of people come to me and go, Michael, I need to get some business. I, I'm, I'm starving over here. I, I don't have any food and I've had three meals. And so I say, are you doing everything that you can possibly do? And they go, no. I then go do it, right? Go do it. Are you doing videos? Are you doing social media? Are you talking to clients? No cards, you should be writing no cards to five people a day. So let's move on and talk about, thank you very much. It's hot in here. Um, so your goal is to move from being totally vital to, to totally dollar productive. What's that? Are you freezing? No. <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron, what's up? That's okay. Okay, so here's an intentional and proactive example. The goal is to maximize output, right? Making 100% of your workday vital. You need to make 100% of your workday vital, meaning you're doing things that cause the needle to turn, right? And so based on yourself and your family time requirements, there's only so much time in a day. Would you say there's any more than 24 hours in a day? So there's 24 hours in a day. You got to have time for yourself, right? You got to have time for your family. You got to have time for your fitness, right? You got to have time to work and make money. So during the hours that you allocate that you're going to work, whether that's nine, 10, 11, or 12 hours as a new agent, right? Uh, you can get to the point where you can work seven, eight hours and make a huge living, maybe even less. But at the beginning, you're working a minimum of nine hours a day and probably six days a week. I recommend everybody take at least one day off. If it has to be a Tuesday or a Wednesday, take a day, decompress, and, and do this. But here's what you got to do. You got how many priorities in a real estate business? Three. And what are those three priorities? Right. So what's in my calendar first? Lead generation, LG right? Lead conversion, LC, and then we got client care. You got time to return calls. You got your workout when you're going to get to the office. You always want to take lunch. I'm so scheduled in my lunch. I will start to get hangry if it's five minutes after 12 and I didn't leave to go eat lunch at <laughs> Charlotte over there. Yep, that's true. <laughs> that's called being scheduled, right? It's like your body starts to know somebody better feed me or I'm going to roar. <laughs> Um, now, now the focus is, focus is the key to success and email and cell phones compromise momentum and look at the word focus. It stands for follow one course until successful, right? Confucius say he who chases two rabbits catches none. 
I mean, you can't catch two rabbits at the same time. So if you focus on one thing, do it until you get it done, then go to the next thing. So here it is, when you focus on the right activity, saying yes to one activity always involves saying no to others, right? So how many times has somebody asked you, hey, Sharon, you wanna come on over and have happy hour? And Sharon's like, yeah, yeah, I wanna go, let's go. Because she wants to please that person asking her over for happy hour. Then later that day, she's like, oh man, why did I say I'd go over there for happy hour? I got so much stuff to do and I got this and I really don't want to go and da, 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 right? So because now she said yes to this, she said no to other things in her life that she really wanted to do and enjoy. So you have to say, say yes to things when it's a hell yes, right? When it's a hell yes. Meaning if somebody asks you to do something, if it's not a hell yes, right? I want to do that. You should probably say, you know, Sharon, as much as I'd love to come over and have a happy hour and get totally obliterated on wine with you, <laughs> I, at this time, I've got other engagements, so I'm going to have to decline. If anything changes in my schedule, I'll let you know, right? Because when you say yes to one activity, you're always saying no to something else. And as long as you're breathing, you're doing something. So the key question becomes, are you doing the right things? Are you doing the right things? You don't know for sure until you fully account for every hour. If you've been in this business longer than a year, you need to start tracking what you do every hour of the day. I'm talking down to the five and 10 minute periods. And you start seeing, when if you track yourself for two weeks, you're gonna see if you're being vital and dollar productive or you're, or you're being irrelevant and wasting time. Because look at it this way, when you schedule time for work, you're scheduling time for work. And when you, when you in, um, invest in something, what do you expect? A return. And so if I'm going to work, I'm actually investing my time in work. So if I'm not at work doing something that causes a return, I'm wasting time. And when you're wasting time, you're wasting money. So every hour of your day, you should make sure when you, your day is working, hey, if you're going to spend time, let's go spend it with our friends, spend it with our family, spend it playing golf, right? Spend it on vacation. But if you're at work, you need to be investing in that time so you get a return. All right. Now, if you feel overwhelmed or not as productive as you can be, you should fully account for your time. And to do this, you must track every hour of the day uh, on the activities that are purchased within that time block, right? Because when you do something in that time block in your work time, you're purchasing time, okay? All right, let's move on. Operating from a vital activities checklist is the only way to assure you remain focused on just the activities that result in success. And time blocking with vital activities assures an un uninterrupted flow, which allows you to ma maintain positive momentum throughout the day. Now there's three phases of a realtor. And I'm telling you guys all this because this is very important, right? It's leading up to all the buyer conversion, the buyer class stuff. But if you don't have your priorities right and your mindset right, forget about learning anything about buyers or listings or sellers or anything else in the real estate business because we got to learn the business goals first and the business uh, sides. So here they are. Your first, first one is you got C's, E's, and P's. And that is... Commitment, confidence, consistency, and cash flow. So let's break that down. First, it's all about commitment. I have to be committed to doing something. All right, like I'm committed to working with buyers since we're talking about buyers today, right? Then I have to be confident, and then I have to be consistent. And then when I am, I will create cash flow. So let's break that down further. Here it is, phase one, the comfort zone. Going big fast. First of all, you have to be committed and you're committed to doing real estate, right? We're committed to making a lot of money in real estate. Now to do so, we have to be confident in what we're doing and you get your confidence from what? Knowledge. Yes, right. The knowledge. Cause you're, and you get the knowledge from training. Training gives you the knowledge and the skills. And I don't care what kind of a technology market it is. Skills pay the bills. It doesn't matter what you know what i mean the world has changed for hundreds of years and it's always been the skills pay the bills now you go from confident to consistency 
and it's consistency in the movement. And then when I say movement, it's in lead generation and lead conversion. Look at those two right there. See anything about those that are important? Two of the three priorities right there. You have to be consistent in the movement. And if you are consistent in the movement with your lead generation, lead conversion, you can be confident, consistent, and you will generate cash flow. And that's what it's all about. This cash flow, right, is the most important thing to generate, especially if you're brand new, because everything costs so much money in this business. Every single month, right? Pay me. <laughs> MLS dues are time for dues, dues, more dues, right? Advertising, marketing. But here's one. Phase one is all about survival. A business survives via cash flow, so you must become confident and consistent with the activities proven to generate cash. And since cash must flow quickly, you should be diligent in your training and incorporate a go big fast philosophy, which simply means open the door to as many potential working relationships as you can on a what? Daily basis. Daily basis. Fielding calls from your comfort zone, right? The wish, wait, and hope. God, I wish I'd get a phone call. Maybe if I wait by this phone, it'll ring. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Um, you need a steady diet of training and movement to generate cash flow. That's it. That's all you got to do. But the truth is most people fail in phase one because they lack commitment. And what do you got to be committed to? Back here again. What do you got to be committed to? consistency in the movement it starts with confidence so you can get your training to learn the knowledge and skills but then you got to be consistent in the movement don't forget it's all about consistency you do something for an hour a day every single day you're going to have results i don't care if you just start picking up the phone and call them random phone numbers and go, hey, you interested in buying or selling a house? Nope, thanks. Hey, you interested in buying or selling a house? Nope, thanks. Hey, you do that enough consistently, you are gonna make money. Now there's better ways with much better scripts and dialogues than doing that, but I'm just pointing out the fact that consistency is probably one of the most important things. Then you've got the mastery phase, right? Now you gotta endure all the pain that comes from being in phase one and doing all these things over and over and over, you're enduring that, and now you gotta be more effective, and the effectiveness comes from the tools that you got, and all your tools are on back agent. Home buyer's guides, right? Home buyer's guides. We've got scripts and dialogues, your items of value, the things that you're gonna present and give to them. These are the things that are gonna help you master the process. And then efficiency is in the models. The models are your uh, three models of a business plan, economic, uh, um, operational, and um, who the hell is it? Um, and who's going to do it, right? Um, I lost my train of thought. Organizational, organizational, economic, operational, and organizational. Those are the three models that you have to be efficient in, right? So then once you've come up with that, you have to do your AMS. Your AMS is your activity management system which is scheduling, getting things done on a schedule. Once I put everything into the schedule and I have document procedures on how to do everything, okay? That's how you master things. And phase two is all about validity. Thus, in order to be valid, you must separate from the pack, from everybody else in phase one that wants to master this business, that wants to be much more successful. You have to separate yourself from them. You have to cut all the waste and become the best you you can be. And moving to phase two requires implementing a vital activities that you learned in phase one, but at a much more effective and efficient level. And since a much higher skill set, along with appropriate tools and systems are required, remaining learning based is crucial in phase two. And what I mean by learning based is, right, a study, practice, action, and then reinforcement training. Because when you come learn something for the first time, and then you're gonna study it and practice it, and you go put it into action, you're gonna get some hiccups. And then you wanna come back to reinforcement training and watch it again and go, ah, oh, I forgot that part. Or, oh, I get it now. Because the teacher will appear when the student is ready, right? Aaron, you teach karate, right? 
you've taught karate for years, second degree black belt. Can you teach somebody something one time, they go put it in action and they never need another class? You gotta come back over and over and over, right? For reinforcement training. That's what I mean by remaining learning based. And that is, I know what I know, but I know there's a lot more that I need to know. There's always more to know. I'll tell you one thing, in my 32 years of selling real estate, I've realized that the longer I'm in this business, the less I know, the more I really need to know, right? There's always something to know. And it's always things that are on a, they're changing too. So the truth is most people fail in phase two because they lack endurance, right? You can be committed, confident, and consistent for short periods of a time. It's doing it through the long haul, being enduring all the pain and suffering that comes with people telling you no, slamming the door in your face, telling you that they want you to get the commission back, right? Enduring all the hardships that go along with all the good times. And then when you finally get to that one point, you're like, yeah, right? And everybody goes, you are an overnight success. You know, like, it took me 15 years to get to here, right? How many bands have you seen that all of a sudden they go, they're an overnight success. And then you go look at their backstory, right? On one of those shows on TV, I forgot the name, uh, Access TV, which is an awesome channel. Um, and then you watch all the backstories and you're like, oh my God, I never knew Journey had so many hard times. Journey had hard times, right? Lots of bands had hard times, but it's because it takes years to get to that point that all of a sudden people will say, man, you're, over, you're an overnight success. You're awesome. How'd you get so good? You're just good at it. You're so lucky, right? You're so lucky. All right. Okay, now let me show you the financial consequences. The consequences could be you either remain broke or become wealthy. The consequences mean one of two things, right? You can have good or bad consequences. So let's look at these. If you work 45 weeks out of a year, you set one appointment, that's being on phase one, remember phase one, that's 45 sets a year. If your show up rate is 50%, that's 23 meetings. If your conversion rate of 23 meetings is 50%, you've got 12 deals. If your percentage that actually buy are 75%, that's nine closings at 6,300 average GCI, gives you $56,970 a year. I, now that's not bad, right? But let's think about this. If you stay on that hamster wheel, and go, all I gotta do is keep doing these same things and just keep doing these same things and being the same that I've always am and always was and always will be, you will stay at $56,000 a year for the rest of your career. Which is why I've met a lot of real estate agents, they go, I got 10 years experience. I go, no, you've got one year's experience you've done for 10 years. And there's a huge difference in that. The difference is it's time to progress to phase two. Now let's think about working the same, um, well, I already talked about all that. Now the same um, 45 weeks, but now because you got better, right? You're more effective and more efficient. Now you go from one set to two sets. And all it is your show up rate went from 50% to 60%, just a little bit better. Just a little bit better, right? You just got a little better. You went from 23 meetings to 54. And then if you go from 50% that qualified to 65 because you got just a little bit better at qualifying your prospects. Now you go from 12 clients to 35. Then you got just a little bit better on closing these people, right? You go from 75 to 85. Now you're going from nine closings to 30 closings and going from 56,000 to 189. Now you tell me how much would you rather make? Absolutely. I think we both know the answer to that. <laughs> right? And what it is, it's the little things of getting better. And that's why you study and practice. You study your buyer presentation. You study the home buyer's guide. You learn the scripts and dialogues. You study neighborhoods. You study prices. You study the process. That way, when you meet people, you get better. And just by getting a little bit better, just think if you got a little bit better every year. You go from 189 to look at this, and you get to phase three, 417. I'm telling you right now, that's a lot of money. This is just, I'm talking about your buyer division. This is your buyer division, guys. This isn't your real estate business. We all have two divisions, right? We have a buyer division and a seller division. The question is, how much is your buyer division making? 
All right, so here's some important, let's start the buyer class. It's a, don't you feel it's important to get the foundation of things, understand why I want you to learn and why I want you to remain learning based? That was why. What's that? That's right, because we want food with our meals. All right, so important buyer beliefs. And that is, I live in a world of abundance. And why that's a belief is, because when a buyer comes to me and they treat me like crap and it's not a win-win working relationship, I walk away. Because I prospect enough and have enough business that I can say no to people that aren't going to do the things the way I want to do things. Okay? And my only limit is time, which means I need to focus, right? I need to invest in my time during business hours because we don't know how much time we got left. I mean, right? That's our only limit. Focus is the key to success. Duplicatable processes and systems guarantee results. That's why I teach you guys great systems and dialogue and processes because by learning those, you're going to get better and better and better and you'll start tweaking those systems, right? You may make it better for you this way or better for you this way, but they'll constantly get better. You have to have those systems. It's unacceptable for my business to earn zero. And I was just talking with an agent about this the other day. They called me up, Michael. This buyer wants me to show them this house. And, and I asked them how soon they're looking to buy. And they said, well, they're really not buying. But because I'm a real estate agent, I should show them that house. I said, uh, no, that's not the way it works, right? It's unacceptable for my business to earn zero, which means if, I, if you don't qualify, I'm going to ask you a series of questions over the phone, which we'll get to here in a minute. If you don't answer those questions the way I want to receive those questions, I'm sorry right? I'm going to be unable to help you today. Um, and it's win, win, or no deal. And what I mean by that, it comes from Stephen Covey's book, right? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And if I have to lose for you to win, that's unacceptable to me. And if you have to lose for me to win, that should be unacceptable to you as well. And so it's got to be good for you and good for me. I will not convert 100% of the leads I do not generate. I love that one, right? You can't convert them if you don't generate them. You're not going to convert them all, but you won't convert any unless you generate a few. People will trust and follow what I can logically and tangibly explain. Now, if I get meet a new client and they say, Michael, I've never bought a house before. Walk me through the process. And if I stumble and fumble and bumble on my explanation of how the process works and I don't seem very confident, about the process and I'm not talking very logically, uh, they may not be buying from me, right? Which is why it's important to study and practice. And time reveals all. And what do we mean by that is, are they a new buyer? Just because somebody says they're a buyer doesn't mean they're a buyer, right? Time reveals all. And I've had people tell me they're a buyer and then down the road I go, they weren't no buyer, that was no buyer, right? That was a looky-loo, that was a pain in the butt, that was a waste of my time. And that's why when you get better at qualifying and reading people, right, you'll get like laser focused. You'll be focusing in on those few things by pretty soon the look in their eye when you ask them how soon they're looking to buy a house and they're lying right to your face and you know it and you drop them. No, you refer them. You go, Charlotte, I got a referral for you. <laughs> hey, you paid me a 25% just because they may buy, right? And if they do, I want my 25%. <laughs> but that day that's true there's many people in the office that will take those referrals from you so before you if you're busy because listen i'm a big listing agent was i had so many listings i didn't have time to work every buyer if it wasn't a cash buyer by at least 500 or plus i didn't have time to jack with them so it was it'd be like harish you ready for a referral and harish is like yeah pick me right yeah i'll pay you 25 percent Absolutely. Motivated, qualified, and loyal people buy homes. Motivated, qualified, and loyal. And having a process reduces the risk that comes with buyers. That's why you have to buy. Buyers is a risky business. Buyers is a very risk. Right, Hedish? His very first buyer was very risky. Um, if they don't meet with me, they're not a real buyer. Think about this, you need an attorney or you need a doctor and you call them up and say, hey, I'd like to meet with you, but I'd like to meet with you over my house. What are they gonna say? Uh, I don't think so. You go meet them at your office, don't you? And you sit down and you have a consultation. 
That's your goal when you meet with the buyer. Now you're gonna meet some buyers that don't care, they just wanna see the house and that's another story, we'll get to that in a little bit. And A buyers deserve my immediate time and attention. And an A buyer is what? Steve, what's an A buyer? Absolutely, winner, winner, chicken dinner, ding, 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 ding. You win the bottle of water. All right, so an A buyer is somebody that's motivated. Motivated means they got to buy. These people are going to buy. There's a motivation causing them they have to buy. They sold their house and they're going to be homeless in 45 days. That's the buyer I want. <laughs> Qualified means they're paying cash or they've already been pre-approved for the loan. They got good credit and good money, good job. And then loyal means they're working with me. They're loyal people. They signed a buyer's rep agreement or they agreed to my loyalty commitment. And we're going to talk about that too. And here's the seven vital responsibilities are, are for buyer. Seven vital buyer responsibilities. First, lead generation. You got to find one, okay? You got to find one. It's kind of like you need a date, right? You go to the bar. I got to get a girl. I found one. I found a girl. I yeah, <laughs> Sharon. All we need is a free drink. Okay, so I found one. Now it's lead conversion. I'm just putting this down into perspectives, right? Now I found somebody, I have to convert them, right? I gotta attract them. I gotta attract them, get them to like me. And so what do I do? I buy them a drink. No, um, so administrative prep, that's the buying them a drink part, right? Get them all hammered, no. So, <laughs> okay, we're getting completely off course here. Focus, focus is the key to success. Then number four is showing, number five is writing and negotiating. Number six is closing preparation. And number seven is your post-closing activities. So here's your vital activities checklist. This vital activities is in back agent. We're going to cover this in a little bit here, but I'm just showing you all 48. And if you look, there's 48 vital activities, but what was this slide before? It said seven vital responsibilities. Look at those. Lead generation, one. And then there's the the vital activities that involve that. Then lead conversion, the vital activities that go with that. Same with administrative, same with showing, writing offers, closing prep. There's a vital activity that goes with, goes with every single responsibility. So there's seven responsibilities and 48 vital activities. And how many dollar productive activities? I said this earlier. Is the dollar productive? No, that's, that's, that was, no, three, you're, you have three priorities. Those are your three priorities. <laughs> okay, I'm completely up. How many dollar productive activities again? 13. Remember the dollar productive checklist? There was 13 activities on there. All right, so let's move right along. So lead generation. <laughs> Where do I find them? Okay, this is why you have to go to lecture, then study, practice, and then go take action. Because you can't see this stuff for the first one time, and then you know it, right? You have to study it and practice it. Now, there are numerous ways of finding buyers, right? And typically, they're going to come into light in your day-to-day -day business, such as calls on property ads, right? Newspaper, Craigslist, magazines, internet, sign calls. The best way to have more buyers is go get more listings. The more listings you have, the more buyers you will have. Former clients, friends, centers of influence, your network, right? Your database. Open house is one of the absolute best ways of getting buyers. And right now, there, it's you can start doing open houses again. It's best if you do them on a vacant property. If you find a seller that's occupied, that'll let you do one, you got to be very careful because you got to clean everything every single time somebody goes in and out of the house. Make sure you provide booties, make sure you provide gloves, masks, or if not gloves, um, hand sanitizer. And you got to clean everything before people get there and when everybody leaves. Yeah, um, you have to have a mask available for them. If they walk in without a mask, you have to provide them one. And if you're in Dallas County, that's the law. It's recommended in Collin County. But Dallas County says, you ain't going in anywhere without a mask. Door knocking, cold calling. 
huge way. Like I told you before, yeah, it sucks, but it works, right? So there's, there's ways to do it that is much better than just, you know, hi, you want to buy or sell a house? We have much better ways of door knocking and cold calling, and we have scripts and dialogues for that. They're all on back agent. Clients that are currently have homes listed, those are really good prospects for buying, right? You could call, somebody's got their home list and go, listen, I'm not calling to list your house, but are you planning on, do you have a buyer's representation agreement with your current agent? <laughs> you could do it, but you got to be very careful. Okay, website inquiries. You can buy things through AdWords, search engine optimization, Zillow. There's all kinds of them. Uh, now you've got Starbucks wearing your name badge, the how's the market dialogue. This How's the Market Dialogue is awesome. I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Referrals from your lender, your inspector, your attorney, your painter, anybody, people that you give referrals to and business to, don't forget, they're out in front of people all the time. My attorney just gave me a referral. So they, everybody does. Um, flyers, just listed, just sold inquiries. Um, you should be sending out postcards to your database every single month. Get a listing from your office that's, that we listed as an office and you send it out to your database, right? Uh, hey, we just listed this house. It's got four bedrooms, three bath, two car garage. Do you know a buyer, right? Do you know a buyer across the top? You mail it to your database. Then when the listing sells, hey, we sold another one. Sold in seven days, 103% of list price, whatever. Now the people that you're sending these postcards to, especially if you're brand new, the worst thing you could do is send out a postcard going, hey, I'm new. Hey, I'm new. I'm in the real estate business. Just want to let you know, I'm new. They're going to go, so what? Get away from me. <laughs> Property call uh, inquiries. Great way. Remax.com, the bouge leads, relocation referrals. You need to go to every convention you can possibly go to out of town, right? When they're in different cities or different states. There has not been a convention I went to that I didn't get a referral or more over the years. Social networking sites like Facebook. If you don't have a Facebook business page, a YouTube and an Instagram, go build that and work on it this week. Referrals from veteran sales associate. Hey, there's people in the office that have so many leads or so many listings that they don't have enough time to handle all the buyer leads. If you buddy up to these people, you can get deals, right, Steve Robin? Absolutely. Okay, so here's the Starbucks name badge. How's the market dialogue? This is a Tom Ferry deal, and I just love it. And, um, and so I tell it to everybody I can. So you're in Starbucks, right? You got your name badge on. You're standing in the line. People, they go, oh, you're with Remax. You go, yeah, I am. And they go, well, how's the market? Every single time somebody sees Remax on your body, they're going to go, oh, you're with Remax. And as soon as you say yes, they say, how's the market? And then this is a good opportunity for you to say, you know, it really depends. Are you interested in buying, selling, investing, or leasing? Because they're all very different in today's market. Which are you most curious about? And they say, well, we're just curious about the overall market. And you want to have a couple statistics, just a couple. And you can get these from CCAR Paul Statistics. And you say, you know, the market is up 11.4%. Listing inventory is down 14.7. And interest rates that are an all-time low, based upon your credit, anywhere between 35 and 4%. So are you curious about how this has impacted the value of your home or perhaps an investment opportunity? And they say, yeah, you know, whatever. And then if they're interested, then you want to say, well, why don't we schedule a time to sit down? I can show you the values and educate you more thoroughly on the market and blah, 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 whatever it is. What I don't want you to do is do this, is when somebody goes, oh, you're with Remax, and you go, yeah. And they go, how's the market? You go, it's great. It's great. Well, if you're a seller, it's great. If you're a seller, man, the houses are flying off the market. It's great. It's buyers are paying way more than they should for houses. It's awesome. <laughs> so, so why are you thinking about, are you thinking about getting you know, buying or selling a home, they go, well, I was going to buy a house. I was thinking about buying $2 million property, but it looks to me like I need to be selling right now. So I think I'll wait. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right? You don't want to do that. You got to remember, it's just like this. So how's the market? Well, that depends. 
Are you interested in buying, selling, investing, or leasing? They're all very different in today's market. And you see my head there, right? You want to make the subtle moments. You go, are you interested in buying, selling, investing, or leasing? Because they're all very different in today's market. So which segment of the market are you most interested in? And they always say, they always say, oh, we're just curious about the overall market. And that's why you got to have two or three good stats. I don't care if you pull them out of your bottom, right? But have something that you remember from a month ago or a week ago or two months ago, something that's relevant, that's close to the, to the exactly what it is, because every market is different in every city, in every neighborhood, in every area. And so if they're interested in buying or selling, now we got to sit down and have a conversation about, you know, what's more important to them or where do they want to buy or sell? Are you following me? Um, okay. So moving right along. Buyers are liars. <laughs> Have anybody heard that before? Buyers are liars. Okay. Well, it's frustrating and disheartening to spend long hours with a buyer only to have them decide not to buy, buy from a for sale by owner, right? Or ask for all your commission or buy from another sales associate or uh, buy and then not qualify for the mortgage. Has anybody ever had a buyer go through all the process, inspections, looking at 75 houses, getting to the, um, with a lender, and then 30 days later, they couldn't get a mortgage? Dude, that money is already spent, right? But I needed that closing. <laughs> That's what the buyer says, or the, the buyer's agent says. I needed that closing. I already bought a new car. <laughs> Trust me, it's been done. Not by me. All right. So, but I have done my share of stuff like that. So there are four ways of dealing with this problem. That is first, you always have the buyer pre-approved for financing, always. And the best way to do this is say, so do you qualify? Not, I've heard people say that. Well, have you talked to the lender yet? You know, all like irritable. The best way to find out if somebody's gonna qualify for a loan is to simply say, are you gonna be paying cash or getting a loan? And they say, oh, getting a loan. I say, great, have you talked to the lender yet? They go, yes, I have. Well, who is it? Well, you know what? I feel it's in your best, uh, it's in your best um, interest. I can't let them think of my words right now. You want to squirrel. It's in your best interest if you get a second opinion. And I've actually got a lender, right? Blah, 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 blah. If you'd like, I can have them call you. But sometimes you can get these two guys working against each other and you can get a better deal. So um, you always want to um, offer to get them a second opinion, but you always also want to get the people's name and number because you wanna also get a pre-approval letter and not a pre-qualification, a pre-approval. You want the buyer to sign a buyer's representation agreement and you wanna pre-qualify for urgency. I mean, remember when I said one of our deals was that uh, time reveals all. Somebody says I'm a buyer, but then they keep looking for two years. They're qualified, they're loyal, but they're not motivated. They just keep looking forever. Yeah, that's not a buyer. And then you want to obtain a commitment of loyalty. What's that, Aaron? Okay, do we have any questions or anything yet? Okay. So, Moving right along. If they won't meet with me, they're not a real buyer. That's my belief. Here's some pre-qualifying questions. When do you want or have to move, right? Um, why, is that, uh, why is that an important time? So what's important about that time frame? You want to dig deeper. If they go, well, we, we need to move in about the next three to six months. Sometimes people say we need to move in eight, or, eight to 12 months. You say, what's important to you about waiting that much time? And I've had a guy say this too. He said, well, the deal is, is I've got a bonus coming in and I know that I need 20% to put down on a loan and I'm still X amount of dollars short. And I'm getting my bonus such date. And then all I did is explain to him what an 80, 10, 10 loan is. And we got the house sold and done in, le in less than 30 days or about 30 days. So you want to dig deeper. And an 80-10-10 loan, for those of you that don't know, is you're getting them a loan with the 80% first, 
a 10% second and 10% cash down. So what your buyer's doing, he's putting 10% cash down. He's got a second lien and a first lien. There's no PMI because it's 80% on the first. And then when his bonus comes, he pays off the second. Now he's got this nice low payment on an 80% loan. Um, so how would your plans be affected if you moved sooner or later? You have to ask these questions to find out. If you find a, if you found a home today, are you prepared to purchase it? Oh no, I don't, I'm not ready to buy yet. Why not? Uh, where are you currently living? Do you own uh, your present home or are you renting? Will you need to sell your current home before you purchase? And if they need to sell their current home before they purchase, now this conversation went to where, Steve? Now it's a listing conversation. Because now I don't care, I could care less about there's a buyer, I'm getting a listing. I'm getting a listing because I'm going to pick up three or four more buyers because I've got that listing. And I'm going to say to the buyer, I'm going to go, you know, um, we have what we call our buy and sell savings program where I can save you thousands of dollars on a sale of your existing home provided you buy your next home through me. You know, when I come over, I can talk to you more about that. So where is your house? <laughs> um, will you be paying cash or getting a loan? Have you been pre-approved? How long have you been looking for a new home? How many homes have you looked at? Uh, why didn't you buy one of those? These are questions you have to ask to dig a little deeper to find out true motivation of people. Don't be afraid to ask these questions because if you're afraid, you know why you're afraid? You don't prospect enough, you don't have enough clients. So because you don't have enough clients, you're afraid to say the wrong thing and you're afraid that if you say something, I'm gonna ruin the deal. I'm gonna disqualify them. They're really not gonna be a buyer and then I won't have anybody. You, I would rather not have anybody than have somebody that's not gonna turn out to be a successful. Um, anyone else gonna be purchasing the home with you? This has happened to me. You go out with a, uh, to a young couple, right? And you're out showing them properties. You showed them everything in town. And because of their price range, they had to settle for this one house. It's not the best house in the world, but it's the best house in the world based upon how much money they have. So now what happens? They're ready to buy it. I go, well, you, would you like to see what this looks like on paper? And what do they say? Well, we need to have our dad look at it. What? What do you mean? Where was dad when we looked at these 75 other piece of craps? Because now dad comes into the picture. He sees one house and he goes, this is a piece of crap. I ain't letting my kids live here. So, so it's an important question to say, anyone else can be purchasing this home with you? Um, are you working with an agent? If yes, have you signed an exclusive agreement? Or is the agreement current or has it expired? Uh, do you have any other ads circled uh, that you are planning to call for information, right? If yes, give me those names and numbers and I'll pull up all the research for you and then we can look at those with me. So here's pre-qualifying questions for financial. What price range do you have in mind? How did you decide on that amount? How much over that amount would you go if the home was really appealing? Okay. What monthly payment are you comfortable with? Uh, do you know about the different down payments and closing cost programs? Uh, is your down payment a gift from someone? Very important to know this, by the way. Um, do you have the down payment in your own savings account? Very important because if it's in somebody else's savings account and now it's coming to you, now we gotta make sure that they're eligible for a gift letter or a gift loan. Uh, needs and priorities. Uh, what will this move accomplish for you? Uh, what neighbors, what neighborhoods interest you? How far from work do you wanna be? What items must be present in your new home, right? What are your needs? What feature or lack thereof would you immediately rule out in a home? What type of home are you looking for? What size, right? Blah, blah, blah. Are you moving up or moving down? Here's what I always say to people. Don't be a Pop-Tart realtor. And this happens. And so people called me up on the phone. I was working at Remax Abrams over on Walnut Hill and Abrams. And I was pretty new in the business. It was probably like 1988, 89. Before computers, before electronic lockboxes, before lockboxes. So what I'm on the phone talking to this guy, I put him on hold, call the listing agent's office, 
they put me on hold. They call the owner, get approval to let me show the house. Then they get back on me to tell me it's okay. I got to come pick up a key at their office. Then I talk to the buyer and I go, well, I can't meet you there till three because I'm on phones. And so I was on opportunity time. And when I got off, I'd meet him there. So this guy agrees to go meet me at this house. I drive from Richardson all the way to Mesquite. I get to the house, right? Well, no. First, I go pick up a key from the listing agent's office in Garland. Then I drive to Mesquite. The good news was it was on the way, but I had to go somewhere else to pick up the key. Now I get there, I'm knocking on the door. The guy's not around yet. I figure I'll, I'll go in, turn on the lights, right? Get everything just light and bright, make it perfect because I'm going to sell this house today, right? That's, I'm, I'm a brand new agent. I'm selling the house today. And <laughs> Emily's laughing. So five minutes goes by. 20 minutes goes by. I don't have one of these to call the guy back. So what do I do? I close the door, lock it up, leave a note on the door. Hey, Bob. I don't remember his name because as soon as he screwed me over, I forgot everything about him. But put a little note on the door. Uh, went down to the phone to call you. I'll be back in five minutes. Run down to the local pay phone and dial 10, 10, 20 because I don't have 25 cents in my pocket. It was a 10, 10, 2, 20 phone number that you could, that you had an account. And so now the guy's call, uh, answers the phone. Hello, Bob, Michael Coburn, I'm over here at the house. You coming? Oh no, I think I changed my mind. That's what I call a pop tart agent. The guy called me. I want to see the house. Yeah, let's go. When do you want to be there? Three o'clock. I'm in. Let's go. No qualifying questions. Are you working with an agent? How soon do you got to move? Uh, are you going to be paying cash or getting a loan? All I cared about was, whoo, I got a buyer and I'm going. I'm going to sell a house, sell a house. I'm so good. Man, I can't wait to tell my mom. <laughs> so don't be a Pop-Tart realtor. And a Pop-Tart realtor is reactive, right? Phone rings. It's a buyer. Let's go. Don't do this. Instead, Time reveals all. Remember our beliefs, which is why we have a belief system. Instead, be professionally skeptical consultant. When they call, phone rings. Whoa, 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 whoa. Phone rings. It's a potential buyer because time reveals all. We don't know if he's a buyer or not. We get into process. And what is process? Qualifying questions. Absolutely. Remember, you take control. You are the professional. Somebody's going to take control, you or him. You have to take control. And I've seen this with women a lot where the male tries to take control of the situation in buyer appointments and listing appointments. So just remember, you always say, listen, I have a process that I use with all of my clients. May I take you through that now? Great. Let me show you how we do it. Okay. When's the last time you went to the doctor, you told him how to give you surgery? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Zillow said that. No. <laughs> okay, so you always ask for the meeting. Are you currently in the market for a new home? Yes. Uh, how are you going about finding your perfect home? If their answer implies they're not being intentional, simply say, how would you like to use a proactive process that will assure that you get the home you want, and more importantly, want the home you get? And they're like, well, what would that entail? It would begin with us getting together about 20 minutes so I can uncover exactly what you need in your next home, define your financial comfort zone, and thoroughly discuss the roles and expectations we would have for one another in a successful working relationship. Does that sound like an approach that could benefit you? And if they say no, right, next. It's like don't ever step over uh, dollar or do dollars to pick up dimes. But if yes, I have two o'clock open. Does that work for you? If no, share with me why you feel that way, right? Share with me why you feel that way. And so this dialogue demonstrates an eagerness to help, which is highly attractive, but I'm telling you, it's missing in both most buyers, uh, most buyers agents. Most buyers agents are Pop-Tart. Do not be a Pop-Tart, take control, or they will run you ragged from the beginning. Think about this. 
the very first time they call you and they say, well, can you show us a house over at 1225 Monica Drive? And you're like, well, let me see if Michael's got it on the market first. No, they, you go, yeah, when would you like to go? Uh, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, I'm open. When do, we, when do you want to go? And they go, well, I don't know. Let me talk to my wife. We'll call you back, right? And then they call you back two hours later. They go, we want to go now. And you, okay, I'm going. Let's go. If I don't go now, he's going to be two more hours before he calls me back again. Now you go jumping out there. Now, every single time they want to see a house, they expect you to go right then. So when somebody goes, hey, can we go see this house at 1225 Monica Drive? I go, when would you like to go? And they go, can we go today? I go, let me see. Uh, well, I've got uh, some time at 11 or 3. And they go, well, how about 2? I go, even if I have nothing at 2. I had nothing on my calendar. I said 11 or 3. They go, well, can we go at two? I go, oh, I've already got an appointment at two. Let me see if I can move them. You know, I think I can. I'll tell you what. I'm going to try and move them. Let's just schedule it for two o'clock. I'll rearrange them. If for some reason they can't rearrange, I'll call you back. Otherwise, I'll plan on meeting you there at two o'clock. Does that sound good? See, that's, that's why you sound like you're a busy man. They want a busy man or girl, right? Yeah, man as real estate agent. Real estate professional, flight attendant, <laughs> stewardess. Okay, uh, so here's the sign call, right? There's going to be times when you have to show a home first. You can't get them to meet you at the office. Remember this. You've got to ask them these questions. How did you hear about our listing? What is it about the home that you liked? Have you seen any other homes that interest you? Do you have a home to sell first? If yes, what is this now? Now I'm going into listing conversation mode. And guess what? If they qualify, I'm showing this house first. I don't care because at that, I'm building rapport and scheduling appointment if I didn't already get it for the listing. Are you currently in the market for a new home? How soon do you need to be in your new home? Are you going to be paying cash or getting a loan? Have you talked with a lender yet? Are you currently working with any other agents? At minimum, I'm asking those questions right there. And those should flow off your tongue without ever having to look for a script, which means you have to do what? Practice. And then uh, if they don't qualify, um, let's say uh, they don't have a home to sell, they're leasing, and they're not going to be buying for three or four months, and they're just kind of like up in the air. Uh, and so to me, that's not an A buyer. At that point, I'll tell them, when would you like to see it? Oh, today at 2. Uh, I'm not going to be able to make today at 2. Let's tell you what. Let me find an agent in my office that, can, that is available to show you that, and they'll meet you there. Is that okay? Good. And now I'm going into referral mode, and I'm going to refer that out. Because there's a lot of agents that will take people and work with them, but you don't want to be that agent because you're what? A professional. And professionals work that way. They have systems and processes. What's that? Yeah, the second type. Now, you have a qualified lead and you can't get the meeting at the office. They just want to see the listing that they're calling about. And this is going to happen a lot. People are calling about a specific house. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to meet with you. They know everything because they've been on Google. And they know everything about everything. Because I bought a house before. It was 30 years ago. I know exactly what I'm doing. Uh, always bring what's called the meet the buyer at the house letter. And that's this little letter right here. It has, well, I'll show you in a minute. So here's a buyer information sheet. These are all on back agent. These have questions and scripts specifically in the sheets that you can use. So you just got to get your sheet together. Um, now you got the buyer. Here's the buyer. <laughs> but all right, so you got a buyer information sheet for a referral, right? Like if it's a referral to me, I use a different sheet because I have different questions on some of them. And then you've got what's called the LP Mama. This is a rural, a rural workman script, uh, or I took it and, and modified it, but the LP Mama was a rural workman. And that is, if you think in your head, all you got to think is I got to find out what location do they want to buy in? What price range do they want to buy in, right? LP, then mama, then motivation is the M. Then I've got, are you working with an agent, A? And then uh, mortgage, 
Um, and then A is appointment again, right? So just make sure you get those out. So some people like using that sheet, some like that one. It's up to you, but you need to have a sheet that when the phone rings, right? You, you either got it laying there if you're on phone time or if you're at your desk and it's a referral and they go, hey, Aaron, it's Michael Coburn. You referred to me. We're looking, my wife and I are looking to buy a house. You should be able to reach in blindfolded, grab that sheet out and go, oh yeah, that's great. Let me, uh, so what'd you say your name was again? And in case we get disconnected, what's a good phone number to reach you back at, right? Uh, first and foremost, you want to get those two things, name, phone number. Um, now, this is the meet the buyer at the house letter. It's a little cover sheet that just says, thank you for taking the time to visit one of our listings. Now, whenever you go and you got to meet them at the house, and you, a lot of times, they're very standoffish. You're showing them that one house. You're not pressuring them to sell. You're a busy agent. They were lucky that you had the time to go show them. But you're going to be there, and you're going to be professional, and you're going to show your worth and knowledge and value in the way you communicate with them, okay? You also wanna show it in the amount of services that you're gonna provide and the tools that you bring with you and the scripts that you use when you're there. Now the tools being the meet the buyer at the house letter. And this is how you're gonna do it. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna stop share for a minute. This way you guys can see this at home too. Okay, this is the meet the buyer at the house letter. It has my business card on top. It's got an MLS printout. It's got the cover letter that I just showed you. And then it's gonna have several different sheets like the benefits of using a buyer's agent. Why do I need a buyer's agent? The home buying process, it's got the home buying process continued. It's got five reasons to sign a buyer's representation agreement. The buyer representation, my duties to you include confidentiality, loyalty, obedience, remember old car. Um, how we are compensated, because a lot of people think, they don't know, do I have to pay you? And then what do you gotta give them at every first face-to-face -face or substantial conversation? IABS. So you got this in this little package. Come up here and role play with me, Emily. Come here. You're just a buyer. You don't have to say nothing bad. So you go and come on over here. Keep coming. You go, hey, Emily, how you doing? Michael Hi, Coburn. Michael. Nice to meet you. Okay, I got the appointment all set up for us. And I got uh, an information about the house right here. And also I got you a, a nice little cover letter, some services that we provide. And then just things about using a buyer's agent. But I know you really don't care about this. You just want to see the house. So let's go look. That's it. That's all you got to do. My point is, okay, go sit down. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. She, my point is this. It's, that's all you got to do. Hey, how you doing? I got this for you. This is all information about this house. And there's some other information about buying a home, blah, blah, blah. But I know you don't really care about that. Let's just go take a look. Now you're in the house and you're going through all your, right, building rapport, showing the property, not going, well, this is the kitchen. Well, most people can see it's a kitchen, right? <laughs> Show your value as, you know, oh, look, it's got coffered ceilings. Oh, look, this is three quarter inch hand scraped hardwoods. Oh, look, it's got the 12 inch base molding, right? Whatever it is that you're pointing out that are different, that people can go, oh my God, this guy really knows his houses, right? Or at least decor. <laughs> so my point is now, you always bring that letter, and here's why. Nobody else is doing this, folks. So by you doing that, you build a rapport, you're trying to close them, and you're leaving to the car, you're not trying to close them to a meeting right there, as far as let's go, let's look at other houses and stuff. Because on the phone, you told them already, I've got 30 minutes to show you that house. So when you book it for the two o'clock, you go, okay, I've got 30 minutes at two o'clock. Now they know they've got 30 minutes. I don't care if your schedule's wide open after that. So now you go, well, like I said, I'm going to another apartment, uh, appointment, but if you guys are interested, I would love to sit down with you, right? If, if you got 20 minutes of your time, I can go through this, that, and the other. And I also got a complimentary home buyer's guide, which is this home buyer's guide that you're going to give them with all this great real estate related information in it. And I'll give you this when we get together. Now you're just scheduling a time to meet back with them at another time, okay? 
don't do the hard sell, don't overclose, don't overpush, right? It's, you think about, remember we go back to the attract, find a girl, attract a girl. Think of it this way now. You finally went on your first date. You like this person, but you don't want them to know you like them that much. You want them to know that you like them, but you don't want to oversell it. Because if, you, if somebody likes you too much, you tend to pull back. If they don't like you as much, you're like, why don't you like me, right? So you want to play that same boy-girl game with the buyer-seller with agents. It's the same mental attitude, okay? I'm telling you, it works. Right, Aaron? Yeah. He's like, yeah, absolutely, Mr. Colburn. No, <laughs> Mr. Colburn. All right, so back to... Um, this is the meet the buyer at the house letter. This is all the information we've got on it. Oh my God, I'm not going to make my one hour, am I? Um, so it's benefits. Why do you need a buyer's agent? Home buying process, continued. These are all on back agent, guys. The buyer representation, how we're compensated, the IABS. Now you want to confirm the appointment. Why do we confirm the appointment? Professionals always confirm. Um, and you want to make sure you still have one. If I would have confirmed that guy in Mesquite, I may never have to drive over there and waste two hours of my day. Um, confirm the appointment three to four hours before the meeting. If it's 11 o'clock, before 11 o'clock the next day, you want to confirm the prior evening. Oh my gosh. Lead conversion, attracting, where, right? The buyer interview should be held at your office unless the buyer has a home to sell, which in that case, now you're doing a listing presentation. And this is going to be done at the buyer's home. The interview should be conducted before showing buyer any houses, except if they got a house to sell. Um, the interview will take anywhere from one to two hours. Now, when you're having your scripts and dialogues with them, say, right, all we need is about 20 minutes of your time. <laughs> Once they're there and you're having a great conversation and they're learning lots of stuff about the market, they don't mind staying an hour, hour and a half, two hours. You don't need that much time, but it may take that much time depending on their questions. Nobody's gonna meet for an hour to two hours. They all will meet for 20 minutes. That's why you don't say, when do you have two hours of your time to meet with me to talk about, <laughs> right? So determine the why behind the move and the emotions that they're using uh, to make the buying decision. We all buy things because it appeals to our emotions. Then we rationalize emotion through logic. To create long-term satisfied clients, a great salesperson makes sure buyer's emotions are met. So your buyer package should include a home buyer's guide, which I showed you guys this little booklet right here. That's on back agent um, and all your tools and fast start tools. Agency brochure, which is IABS, uh, your buyer's representation agreement, the interview form to discuss the buyer's wants and needs, copy of the purchase agreement, all addendums, and you just write sample across it, staple it together, uh, mortgage rate information, articles on the market conditions or stats from CCAR, which is great, uh, property tax information, testimonials, title insurance, area information, relocation, schools, utilities, amen amenities, any good information. My role, your role in the communication plan. Now, I put my role, your role, and communication plan inside this book. So here it is, right? What can you expect from Michael Coburn as your buyer's consultant? Then the com my communication, how I communicate and how they – see, because um, you've got to manage expectation. Conflict only arises when expectations – right. And then you got your role. Now you're going to tell them. Let me tell you your role in this deal. We're going to get to that in a minute. So your resume, personal brochure, meet the team, contact information, whatever, and a map of the area. You probably don't even need a map as much anymore because now, now we got GPS and Google Maps and all that. But some people still love to have a map of the area. Like if they're moving to Allen, um, the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce, Commerce well, they'll have maps that you can get from them, like with advertisements and stuff that pays for the maps. People love to have like real maps. They're looking into areas that they're moving into. All right, 
So before meeting the buyer, you want to get on the selling channel. You must be intentional, proactive with your conversations as it does you no good to get at bat if you can't knock, knock it out of the park. You want to knock it out of the park, right, Smiley? All right. Um, make sure you're in the correct mindset. Before you enter the room, clear your head of any and all outside distractions, okay? Think about this. When you go to meet a buyer, when you're doing real estate, you've got a lot of deals going, right? You may have just hung up the phone with a fight from your spouse. You may have just been on the phone uh, talking to another agent about another deal you're doing and they're going, the appraisal didn't come in. It's $30,000 low. And now you're freaking out and stressed out. And then the front desk calls you and go, hey, your two o'clock appointment's here. It's showtime, guys. It's showtime. You got to clear your head and get focused on the conversation at hand right? Which is why it's required to be looking at all your scripts and dialogues, memorizing the people's name, because you've got to constantly say their names in the presentation to keep to pulling them back into the conversation. And focus on a conversation. Oh, and imagine the desired end result. What's the desired end result of this meeting? I like all those answers, but it's a win-win working relationship. Remember when, when it's, it's all about, don't go into this meeting of, I got to get the buyer to sign a buyer up. I got to get this buyer. Oh, I need this buyer. I got to have them. No, you go in with, well, let's see if we got the makings of a win-win working relationship. Hey, if I'm good for him and they're good for me, we're going to get along and, and this is going to be a great relationship. You go in with that attitude, that's better mind, fr mind frame and mindset than going in with, think about listings. Got to get the listing. Got to get the listing, right? Got to get the buyer. Got to get the buyer. No, get that out of your head. It's not about that. You're there to see if you have the makings of a win-win working relationship. So meet at the office in the reception area. It's a proven statistic. If you meet them in a neutral area and then move to a conference room, um, it's more comfortable for them in the new place because you went there together versus them sitting there waiting and then you show up. They're uncomfortable. So because that I heard about that psychological report. I wanted to use every opportunity to my advantage, right? So that's why we have everybody meet up at front. We sit them on the little couch or sofas or chairs, and then we call you, you come up, and now you're prepared, which is why I don't have my agent sitting on the front desk doing phone time because then somebody comes in and they go, yeah, we're here to, um, talk, about, to talk to an agent about selling a house. And you're on phones, right? You're like, oh, um, uh, well, I'm an agent. And they're like, well, why are you playing receptionist, right? Instead, our reception team goes, well, let me get an agent for you. And they go, hey, Aaron, we have somebody here. We'd like to talk to you about selling a house. Now Aaron goes <laughs> in the back because he's like, oh, my God, what do I do? What do I do, right? How did you know? but, but he doesn't do it in front of the client. He doesn't do it in front of the client. He does it in the back. He gets his thoughts together runs into my office says, what do I got? No, no. Now he just puts his package together and he comes out there and he's like, Hey, Aaron Chen, how you doing? Come on in the conference room. See, now he looks like a professional. That's the way you do it. And that's why I don't have my agents sitting on the phones on the front desk. We got an own little place in the back where nobody can see you and go, why is your agent answering phones? That's not a professional agent, right? When I started and grew up in real estate business, that's what we did. We sat on the front, answered the phones because they didn't want to pay a receptionist. That's the truth. All right, so now you're like, hi, I'm Michael Coburn. It's a pleasure meeting you. Or if you met him at an open house, it's great to see you again. Escort them to the conference room, right? Then you got to build, build rapport. If you're a natural rapport builder, just do what comes natural. If you're not, think of Ford. Start immediately talking about their family, their occupation, their recreation, their dreams. But just keep it to a minute or two. I mean, I started building, doing Ford with one guy once in a meeting. It wasn't too long ago. And it was like 45 minutes later. I'm like, oh my God, when are we going to talk about business here? I got to go. Right? I mean, you can get lost in Ford. Just keep it to a couple of minutes. You're just trying to warm each other up. If you see he's and she's well warmed up, let's get into the meeting. And now you say what, Emily? I have a process that I use with all my clients. May I take you through that now? Okay, now you wanna set the tone. 
And now there's three comport, uh, components to setting the tone with the buyer. And they are the win-win, the agenda, and confidentiality. So when a buyer walks into the room, you sit down, you just finished rebuilding rapport, and then you say to them, listen, I've got a process that I use with all my clients. May I take you through that now? They go, yes, you better have a process. And the first thing is to tell them what to expect, manage expectations. And that is Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. First, let me say, I really appreciate you meeting with me today. And I want you to understand that my goal here today is to establish the foundation for a win-win working relationship. And then you go, a lot of real estate agents are willing to sacrifice a win-win relationship in order to simply sell a house. I want you to know up front, I don't operate that way. With me, it's win-win or no deal. And they go, oh yeah, that's good, Michael. Okay. And this just literally takes 15 seconds. And then you go into the agenda. Since this is going to be a large financial investment on your part, because think about it, guys, if they're buying a $150,000 condo or a million five ranch home, to them, it's a large financial investment. So you say, since this is going to be a large financial investment on your part, we want to make sure you get the home that you want, but more importantly, you want the home that you get, okay? Therefore, what we are going to do before we get in the car is define your perfect home. Make certain of your financial parameters and thoroughly discuss the roles and expectations we would have for one another in a successful working relationship. Is this agreeable to you? And you always do this because you're telling them they go, yes, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see? Okay, then confidentiality. Now, I want you to rest assured that anything said here today will remain totally confidential. So please feel free to be as open and honest with me as you feel you can be. Are you ready? Great. May I ask you some questions and take some notes? And they're going to go, sure. And don't be afraid that you're taking notes. Listen, when you go to a nurse or a doctor, or whatever, they're writing stuff in the file, right? About what you, so you got to make notes. And here's your buyer interview. This is also on Backager, right? You're opening and you don't have to go through every single one. Just, you can maybe highlight a few that you want to talk about and maybe have them yellowed in a highlighter before they get there. Some of the answers that they give you may answer two or three of these. So if it does, you don't want to repeat a question of an answer they just gave you, okay? So just think about this when you're going through it. Now, this, the sheets are set up to, you know, personal information, experience. So now we're talking about, tell, hey, have you guys bought a house before? Tell me about the house you bought before. Tell me about your experience with the agent that you had before. What did you like about that agent? What did you not like about that agent? What do you expect from me this time? See what I'm saying? And when they're starting to tell me what they liked and what they didn't like, I'm planning my presentation around those two things right there. Okay? As long as it makes sense. I'm not going to pick them up in a limo and provide slushies while we go looking at houses. That's what I expect from my agent. <laughs> I want champagne and limos. Then urgency, right? We're going to talk about urgency. Then needs and priorities. Uh, financial con. Now, if they're buying a couple million dollar house, I'm doing champagne and limos. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> okay, so now you want to verify the buyer's motivation. You just went through and had this little interview. So once you have focused buyers, you must retest their motivation again because you already did it before and you ask the following question. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, when we find a home that meets all of your needs and the majority of your wants, will there be anything keeping you from making an offer? No. Great. You're going to transition into the home buyer's guide, and now you're going to walk them through this fairly quickly, except for the part that comes in when you're talking about uh, my role, your role, expectations, and uh, your commitment for loyalty. You want to always get their commitment for lo loyalty. People will do what you say if, if they're no, if, uh, as long as they know what to expect, what's expected of them, okay? Most people just are never told, so they don't know. Oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to buy another house from a builder. I thought I was only looking at houses with you from uh, the pre-existing homes. You never told me. Well, then that, it's my fault, okay? If they say, uh, no, we're just looking right now, or I don't think we're ready to buy, you say, well, when do you think you will be ready? And they say three to 12 months. What do you say? Nope, we talked about this. 
Why? What's important to you waiting three to 12 months? See, they're going to say three or four months or eight, 10 to 12. I'm just giving a big brain. What's important to you waiting three to 12 months? And they're, and they say, right, whatever you get, whatever they say, you got to just respond appropriately. Or if the buyer just says, well, we're just looking. What's one of our beliefs? It's unacceptable for my business to earn zero. And a lot of times um, they're stalling. So you have to say, listen, I really appreciate that. And since we are currently in a seller's market, houses do move on a daily basis so that we don't waste any of your time and have you fall in love with a home that may not be around, probably won't be around when you're ready. I recommend that we wait until you're fully committed to buying a home. Is that fair? They're going to go, yeah, I see your point. Most logical people will say, yeah, I get, I see your point. Yeah, let's wait. Okay. Then you go, great. Would you mind if I stay in touch with you through the mail as well as a phone call now and again? That way, when you're ready to buy a home, I can virtually assure you of getting the home that meets all these specific needs, right? We already know what they want. So now they agreed that I'm going to stay in touch with them. I'm going to delegate them to an eight by eight, which means if they're going to buy something the next three months or so, I'm going to put them on a postcard mailing one a week, every week for eight weeks or the 16 touch is if they're further down the road, I'm doing one a week uh, for six, 16 weeks. And then, um, but I also want to make sure to immediately put those people in my client appreciation program, every piece of mail, every piece of uh, anything I do in that client appreciation program, they're getting it. These are what you call your B buyers. They're um, qualified, loyal, just not motivated yet. They got something to wait for. Okay. And as soon as it comes time to closer, as soon as it gets closer to that time, you're there. Okay. But you just got to ask them, you know, listen, I don't want to be a pest, but I want to make sure I'm there when you're ready. So how often would you like me to communicate with you? If they go, listen, don't call me back. I'll call you when I'm ready. Okay. Right. But I'm still adding them to my client appreciation program. Buyer, that would be fine. Good. If they say, no, that's not fair. I want to look which has happened to me. You have to, do you remember at the beginning of our conversation when I told you I was here to create win-win working relationship? And they go, yeah. You go, I think we may have just violated that agenda. This is how you get out of that appointment. I mean, we have a common goal and that is getting you into your perfect home. Is that correct? They go, yeah. You go, great. I'm going to commit 100% of my efforts toward finding your perfect home. All I ask is that when we find that home, you be prepared to buy it. Otherwise, the overall goal of getting you into your perfect home has not been accomplished. Does that make sense? <laughs> Super. Then shouldn't we make this a win-win relationship from the start? You always got that smile on your face. You got Hey, you can't look at anybody unless you've got confidence, right? So you make sure you got confidence. What's our number one? Commitment. Confident and consistent. And you're gonna get cash. And you gotta be confident. Confidence is the number one thing you gotta have over anything. You gotta have confidence. And you gotta do whatever it takes. I don't care if you fake it till you make it. If you're, it's showtime and you're acting, you act confident then. If you don't have confidence, you better act it. Right? If they say no, you're next. Remember, you live in a world of buyer abundance, which means I don't have to work with people that are like that. If they go, no, we just want to keep looking now. We're going to keep looking until we find something. We just want to, listen, I've got a new agent in my office that loves to do nothing but show property. He doesn't care if he has any food with his meals. If you like, I'll, I'll refer you to, to Harash, right? <laughs> Here's what I think. Here's, you want to know the truth of that, Hadesh? I would say if these guys are like three, four, five months away from looking, I say as a brand new agent, you should work them if they want to keep going because you don't have anybody else yet. So what you're doing is you're learning. You're previewing property, learning the market with a buyer that may buy it. Otherwise, you're going to go preview property anyway for free without a buyer. So when I say that, I'm not saying that to make fun of a new agent. I'm saying that to give a new agent an opportunity to learn the business while they're waiting to buy. But when you get busy listing and selling homes, you don't have time for that buyer, but somebody in the office does.
Okay, that's all. Now, if I was a new agent, <laughs> give him to me. Hey, he's he's loyal and qualified. He just not doesn't know if he's ready to buy yet. I'll take my chances. What I'm not going to take my chances is with is loyal, motivated, and not qualified. <laughs> now we boot that guy to the curb, right? Or if they're motivated and qualified, but they're not loyal, boot that guy to the curb. That's the worst guy. That's the worst guy. That's a guy that'll take up every Saturday and Sunday, every night that you have until September, and this is June, and then they're gonna call you one day and go, hey Mike, thanks for all your time and efforts. You were so great. But you I mean, we went to those open houses last weekend. We found the perfect home. I don't even know where it's been, but yeah, so we bought it and we just want to call and say thank you. What? Are you kidding me? Dude, this happens. Not if, you are, not if you do things the right way, it won't happen to you. And that is educating them. You have to educate them, letting them know what they can and can't do. So here's the transitional phrase, right? Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, let's switch gears for a moment. It's been my experience. Oh, so this is the, the buyer that was ready to buy. He's like, yep, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Now you're transitioning to the buyer's rep agreement, or buy, uh, the buyer's guide, buyer's rep agreement. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, let's switch gears for a moment. It's been my experience that conflict arises uh, when expectations differ. And you, would you agree? Yes. Great. With that in mind, let me share with you what I feel you have the right to expect from me as your consultant. And now you hand them the home buyer's guide. And did I put the buyer's thing? In, and then, yeah, would you like to see the home buyer's guide? Here it is. All right. So in here, we have what they can expect. And it just simply says, first of all, I'm going to treat all parties uh, fairly and honestly. Uh, always ensure we keep a win-win working relationship. Respect your time, needs, and finances. Be on time for all meetings. Communicate openly and frequently. You'll see this is all in back agent. It's phenomenal. Um, and then you're going to go into their role as well. Here you go. So... If the buyer has been allowed to self-discover what a working relationship with you is like, and you've established yourself as the worthy professional, closing is a snap. I mean, really is. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, after our conversation, I feel we have the makings of a win-win working relationship. Wouldn't you agree? Now you're doing this. I really like you. You know what? I really feel we have the makings of a win-win working relationship. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> I must start to laughing and ch choking and breathing at the same time. <laughs> great. Would you like to meet? Now you're like, great. Would you like to rep me to represent you in the purchase of your new home? And if yes, then you can cover the IABS uh, and the buyer's rep agreement. Now in here, I just want to go over it with you and show you guys. If they don't want to sign a buyer's rep, because there are some people that will not sign a buyer's rep. Listen, Michael, I will buy from you. I am loyal, but I am not going to sign that agreement. And I'm just going to make sure I get a commitment of loyalty. And that's right here. And it says, listen, I would like to commit to finding you your perfect home. I must ask for one thing in return from you. That is you commit to working exclusively with me. This is the one place most agents fall down and don't say this to the buyer. And then when the buyer buys from somebody else because they didn't know, the agent gets mad and says, buyers are liars. Now, by exclusively, I mean if you attend any open houses, you're looking them right in the eye too, if you attend any open houses or talk with any new home builders without me, that you let them know immediately you are represented, happily represented by me. And you always want to give extra business cards to them. And I'll tell you that in a minute. If you drive by, see a home, or see a home in a, a magazine, or see it online, I'm covering all bases that you think meets your criteria, you call me. Also, that you not solicit the service of any other realtor. Is that okay? Uh, is that fair? And they go, they go, yeah. They go, I can guarantee you the best service in the industry if you can guarantee me your loyalty. So what do you say? They go, yeah, we can do that. Good. Because some people don't want to, even if they do want to sign a buyer's rep, I say that right before we go into the buy rep.
It's what? Are you talking about water bus coming again? The bottom line is this, I'm managing expectations by having a conversation. I'm looking somebody in the face and I'm asking them to be loyal. If they determine that they're a jackass later and buy from someone else because they're not loyal, see ya. I missed that one. Apparently it wasn't a win-win. I misjudged them and you know what? Sometimes you're the bug and sometimes you're the windshield. I mean, you're not gonna win 100% of the time, right. but when you tell, when, if long as, listen, I educated, okay, here, let me tell you guys a story. Sorry, guys, online, I got to tell a really good story. I had a relocation buyer coming in from South Texas. They were referred to me from another REMAX agent. And so I made all the appointments. Uh, they wanted to go see properties on a Saturday. At the time, I did tons of listings. I did not work weekends unless it was somebody that needed to list the house on a Saturday. My buddies all wanted to go golfing with me that Saturday, and which is why we moved it to Friday. No. Um, so I got, I found out everything I needed to find out from them on the phone. I pulled up all the houses to go show properties, uh, made all the appointments, and here's the deal. I've got the buyer rep agreement, the IBS, everything's out, ready to go, meeting them at the office before we go look, because if they don't sign, I'm going golf, right? So I'm all excited, okay, because they want to go look like uh, down in Dallas, like uh, M Streets, which is Lower Greenville. They want to go look in Lower Greenville, and my uh, office it was in uh, Frankfurt and Preston, and I lived in Willow Bend at the time. So I'm thinking, I meet him at the office, Frankfurt and Preston. We have a little conversation. They don't want to be loyal and sign the buyer rep agreement. I'm out. Okay. About an hour before, Mike. Oh man, we had a rough night last night. Yeah, we met our friends down here, and we just drank way too much. We got the hungover. Blah blah blah. This kind of stuff, right? Since we're going down to Lower Greenville, can we just meet you down there at a Starbucks? I'm like, shit. yes, sir, not a problem, right? Because that's what you do. You're in the service industry. Yeah, not a problem. Yes, sir. So now I'm thinking to myself, damn. So I go driving down there. There's two Starbucks on Abrams and Mockingbird. One's inside of Tom Thumb that I saw the sign for first. The other one's in the other end of the parking lot in the same parking lot as the Tom Thumb. So I'm sitting there and, and then they're calling me, I'm calling them, I'm going, dude, I'm right in here now. He goes, where? He goes, we're in the such and such. I go, I'm looking right now, there's nobody at the counter, right? And then all of a sudden he goes, are you at the Starbucks? And then I go, are you at the Starbucks inside the Tom Tom? Oh no. So I realized it's the wrong one. First check, right? I'm thinking this appointment sucks. So now I get to going over to the right Starbucks. She's still up at the counter. He's sitting in the chair. He goes, you want something to drink? I said, nope, not a problem. I opened my file. Uh, she comes back from the deal. I go, let me just show you a few things before we go. He goes, well, let's just go and look at the car. I go, well, I got to go over a few things with you. And so I pulled out all the sheets. I go, this is the first house you want to see. It's available. I got the appointment for that. This is the other one. Da, 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 da. It's available. This one right here, contract pending. They don't want to show it. Can't get in and see it. These houses go fast. This one's available. I'm going through all, buttering them up, getting them, show them all the good stuff. I got all the appointments. We're ready to go. I said, this is the information about broker services. It simply states when you're working with a broker, you need to know who they represent. It's got to be in writing. That's what this agreement is here. Here, it's the buyer's rep agreement. And he goes, wait, 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 what, what, what's all this? I go, it's the buyer's representation agreement. He goes, well, I don't want to sign nothing. I said, listen, I work by exclusive representation. If you guys want to go see these houses today, you're going to have to sign this agreement. Well, no one, no other realtor had to sign that agreement. I said, are you working with another real estate agent? And is, and I said, listen, if you guys want to go see those houses today, I only work by exclusive representation, which means you have to sign this form. I said, or I could waste my whole day with you and then you buy from somebody else. I said, I don't work that way. I'd rather be golfing. If I'm gonna not make any money today, I'd rather go have fun. And I took flat out told him. The wife goes, oh honey, just sign it. He signs it reluctantly. She signs it happily. All right, let's go. Now I'm all happy, yeah, come on, <laughs> right? And so we get to the first house and I'm pointing out this and he's asking that and I'm talking about this and oh, make sure if we do that. Now, if you like this house, we got to inspect this and da, 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 da. And I'm just going through just being knowledgeable about houses. Got to the second house 
and I'm opening up the doors and I'm saying something about the overhanger, whatever, I don't know, something. And I, as I'm opening the door, he said, man, Mike, he goes, I can see you really know your stuff. I sure am glad I signed that agreement. I showed him seven more houses that day. Not, he didn't like not a one of them. I said, listen, guys, here's my business cards. If you go to any open houses or new home builders, make sure you give them my cards. Because if not, they're like furniture salesmen. You walk in, they attack you. I said, all you got to do is show them my card and they'll back up. I said, just go, hey, we're working, Michael. And they go, okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. I said, yeah, not a problem. Leave, call my buddies. Okay, I'm ready to go. They waited. I was out golfing. The listing agent of an open house calls me, goes, your buyers want to buy my listing. I finished golfing, called him up. Yeah, Michael, we found the perfect house. We want to buy it, but we want you to see it first so you can tell us what you think of it. When do you want to go? Tomorrow. I'm thinking, Sunday? <laughs> Not a problem, right? It's what you do to make 12 grand. Anyway, I sold him that house. But I will tell you right now, if I didn't press the issue and wasn't strong and confident on the buyer rep, they would have bought it at that open house from that guy after I showed him all seven houses. Guarantee you. Guarantee you. All right, moving right along. Yeah. At, like in, in, a, in a showing? No, like before they buy it. I don't know because it's a different market right now. There's not as much inventory. Back in my day, we had like seven and eight months worth of inventory. So you could show somebody a hundred houses easy. But nowadays you, you could show anywhere from five to 12 houses and you're done. I've had houses. I show one house, you buy it. It's called a lay down, right? I learned that term from a guy who did a house like that. He owned a carpet business and he goes, he goes we call that the lay down. So ever since I called it the lay down. All you had to do is come in and lay it down. They bought it that quick. All right. So here it is. So your homework is to get with the lender as soon as possible. This is what I'm telling the buyer, right? Does that sound good? Great. I'll be sending you listings that meet your criteria. Please drive by. I always tell them drive by and see how you like the exterior in the neighborhood. Once you find the house uh, or three that you like, call me. We'll schedule time with the seller to view the inside. Does that sound good? Great. Please take this sales contract, but don't call it a contract, say agreement. I wrote contract, but it's not, it's an agreement. And write sample on it, and you want them to look at it and say review it, because it's what we will be using to submit an offer. I want them to be completely comfortable with it and not see it for the first time when it's time to make the offer. Um, it was a pleasure meeting you. I look forward to uh, working with you in your journey. Between meetings, you gotta complete the following homework. Send clients a thank you letter. Call the loan officer, verify their price perimeters, call the, the buyer and verify the price ceiling. Oh my God, I'm not gonna get this done in an hour, am I? Insert your criteria one at a time into the MLS or your FISBO inventory if you have one. I don't have time to talk about that today. Set up the client on a prospect gateway uh, and a lead street search or um, whatever program you're using. So client will receive emails of the listings on a daily basis. Prepare the showing packages. Now, you prepare relevant showing packages. First of all, you call the listing agent for each home that you're gonna tour and verify the home is still active, right? And request any re uh, related disclosures and notices. Print the full MLS agent report. Prepare pricing information, which is just quickie CMAs. You want a quickie CMA on every price house that you're gonna show and the tax information because buyers always ask you questions and it's done when you go, oh, well, I don't know, I don't see it here. Uh, let me see, uh, uh, I don't know, right? And if they go, well, Michael, we love this house, we wanna, what do you think of it? And if I don't have a little CMA to show them what the prices are of houses, I may be missing the boat. And we'll talk more about that and, and we get into fast start. Schedule showings 24 hours in advance. It never fails when you wait to the last minute to schedule something. The house that they really wanted to see was one that needed a 24 hour notice and you're calling three, four hours notice and they will not let you in it. So meet, uh, try to meet the buyer at the office first, review all the buyer's needs, regain focus. Now you're gonna reveal all the packages for each home. You're gonna show them all the different properties you want to discuss all the ins and outs about each one, make sure that they meet all their needs and the majority of their wants. 
ask client if they had a chance to review the sales contract. Do they have any questions or concerns? Make a copy of their driver's license and inform someone in the office of your agenda, right? Now you go to the car. So you do all that before you even get to the car. And remember, you only get in the car with what buyers? A buyers, baby. Now, when you show up to the house, you want to go to the home, park across the street, walk up to the home, ring the doorbell, unlock the car, or unlock the door, identify yourself, right? If it's somebody that sounds like somebody there, realtor, mom, home. Take a step back and encourage the client to go in. Go in, look around, open any door. Turn Now, showing like this is a little different. Now that there's with the COVID, you need them to follow you. You touch everything. You turn on all the lights. You turn on all the, uh, open all the doors and open the blinds. Tell them, follow along behind and don't touch anything, okay? Do not be play tour guide. Your role is to tour the home with a discerning, logical eye so you can uncover and discover things right, that an excited, emotional client will miss. This is what I did with that one client out at the lower Greenville area. Uh, you're also, you wanna make sure that the home contains all the needs and the majority of the wants that appear in the MLS printouts. And then as you trail behind, turn off all the lights um, that were turned down by your client, which is a little different now. So when you're showing homes, oh my God, am I really this far behind? I'm like way behind. Okay, could you, so when you're touring the home at the tour end, you say, could you see your home, uh, yourself living in this home? They go, no, it's too small. So you feel it's too small, is there anything else? They go, it has no view. You say, so you feel it's too small and it has no view, is there anything else? No, never argue and go, small? This isn't small, look, it's a 16 by 18 room. Most rooms are 10 by 12. You can't argue. To them, their reality is it's too small. So you think it's too small and it has no view, is there anything else? No. So, and then you say, then let's play a game. If you had to buy a home today, and this was the only home available, would you buy it? And you know, you gotta assure them that you're not trying to close on them, right? Um, but if yes, this becomes the home that you're gonna compare all the next houses to. If no, if this is the only home available and they're not gonna buy it, you go on. You tear up that showing package. By tearing up the showing package, and you move on to the next home, it sends a message, a fun dramatic visual that this home is no longer a viable option. So once you find the perfect home, you close with, shall we see how it looks on paper? Buyer, I wanna think about it, right? Pray on it, sleep on it, whatever they say. And you're like, great, definitely I think that's what you should do, but let me ask you one question though. If this home sells tonight, are you gonna be okay with it? I mean, someone may have looked at this home last night thought about it, slept on it, prayed on it, and now they're over at the agent's office right now writing an offer. I mean, if it, I'll be okay if it sells, but I wanna make sure you will, right? And they're like, buyer, yeah, I'll be okay. And then if the buyer is gonna be okay, you say, then what's our plan B if this home sells? Do we have a backup? And they go, we don't have one. Then you give them the momentum close. Then since we're here together, my advice that we complete the offer with an option period. And even if they accept our offer as written, we still have 10 days to terminate the contract. It only costs you hundred bucks. This way we don't waste any unnecessary time. However, if you decide you do want it, we didn't waste the time. How does that sound? Shall we see how it looks on paper, right? What do you think we should offer? Okay, in this, this is what I always say. The buyer is always gonna say, what do you think we should offer? In this market, you should always make your first offer your best offer, as sellers are receiving multiple offers. So you have to ask yourself, how much, it is, how much it is it worth for you to lose it, and how much is it worth for you to get the home, right? Meaning, if you offer 250,000, and someone else offered 251,000, and you lose the deal over $1,000, are you gonna be upset? And they go, if not, then 250,000 is your number. If they go, yeah, I would be then you need to go as high as you can go till if somebody else paid one more dollar, you're fine with losing the house. And that's what your best offer is. You need to pay the most you could possibly pay and still be fine with it. Make your first offer your best offer. Remember, there are very few homes available. You saw them. This is the only good one, right? And buyers are fighting for them. We're a multiple offer situation. You need to make your best offer, first offer your best offer.
if a buyer wants to lowball, you got to re-verify their motivation by asking, we can do that, but are you looking for a home or looking for a deal? We want both. Are you prepared to lose a home trying to get a deal? Buyers always do that too. They'll lose three or four homes trying to get a deal before they realize I wasn't lying in the buyer rep or in the buyer's meeting. Buyer, no, I want the home. Great. Then let me tell the seller what you're willing to give so we don't offend them and get into a counter counter situation and allow someone else to sneak in and submit a better offer, right? Uh, is this your perfect home? Uh, if this is your perfect home, let's not take any chances and make your first offer your best offer. What do you mean by offend? Well, I mean, if we can't justify our price beyond we're looking for a deal, then the message we're communicating to the seller is one of you have to lose for us to win. And creating an adversary from the beginning may not be the best approach. It's absolutely not. Giving, we're probably going to be asking the seller to make certain repairs and other concessions once we're under contract. Understand, I'm going to support you and do what you tell me. However, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't inform you of the potential consequences that go along with the approach that you're suggesting. Everybody follow that? So what would you like to do? Writing an offer. Before writing an offer, always call the listing agent. Is the home still available? Do you have any offers working on the listing? If yes, how much are they offering? Don't be, don't be amazed. Some agents will tell you. Some agents will tell you. Um, is it your buyer? If it's their buyer, they have to tell you if you ask. If you don't ask, they don't have to tell you. If no, do you, do you know if they were working the buyer and you ask, they got to tell them that you are representing the buyer or have the buyer. If no, do you have any offers coming in? Because I want to know if something's coming. If this is the seller in town and available to respond, should I present an offer? <clears throat> Where would you like me to send the offer? Do you prefer fax? Are you a caveman or do you prefer email? <laughs> what is the seller situation, right? Relocation, new home divorce. I always ask. Sometimes they won't tell you, but always ask. What is the seller's timing? How soon can they move? Get the seller's disclosure in advance, check Netris. Make your offer attractive, a higher sales price. Right now, since it's a seller's market, especially if there's multiple offers, make your first offer your best. You can include more earnest money. Some people think that earnest money is really valuable. We'll talk about that in another class. Do no option period. A short option with high option dollars. These are things that you can do if the buyer's okay with it. Pay for your own survey, survey if the seller doesn't have one. Close at the title company the listing agent is requesting. Every listing agent's got their favorite title company. If you're competing, go with it. Don't try and argue over a title company if you're competing. No financing contingency in the third party addendum. Let's check, this is not contingent upon financing. You still got the appraisal and the, uh, it's gotta meet lenders underwriting requirements contingency. Um, no seller concessions. Don't ask for closing costs if you're in a multiple offer situation. Um, ask what's the best timing for the seller. Be flexible. Give a free lease back if they need it. A week, a month. Sometimes, let's say, you, you know, you run the price up to a certain amount that you're worried about the appraisal, but they need a 45-day lease back. You run the price up as high as you can. You give them a free lease back. That's a win-win. Um, you offer to pay the title policy. Buy your own HOA docs. If it's got an HOA, you can do no option period. Offer to buy your own HOA docs. Tell them we won't, we'll, we'll get them within 21 days. Then you get them on the 21st day, right? You still have three days to terminate that contract for any reason per the HOA docs, per the addendum for the docs. So you gave yourself a 24 day free option. Most listing agents don't know that. No contingencies, right? Use the appraisal clause that the buyer will pay the difference over, over the, between the list price and the price that they offered. So if the list price is 300,000 and you offered 310, uh, tell the listing agent, my buyer will pay the 10,000 over if it only prices for 300. Uh, they like that because they're concerned about the appraisal too. Uh, make it easy on the seller to accept your offer. Be super nice, gracious, be amicable, right? You have to be. Um, by submitting an offer over list price, use the appraisal addendum only with the buyer's permission and approval. 
Don't just slap it in there and throw it on them. And then later you go, well, I thought you'd want this, you know? And they goes, well, I don't got an extra 10 grand. Um, now you submit the listing offer. You tell the listing agent all about your buyer, how much they love the home, that they're pre-approved, how many children, anything that's going to pull on the heartstrings of the seller. Uh, have your buyer write a letter. If you're a listing agent, we don't accept those letters. There's, but as a buyer, you can submit them. Submit an offer with a pre-approval letter. Always submit the pre-approval if possible. If not possible, submit one and let them know they're coming. All right. A time limit on response. Call the listing agent. Let them know that, the, that you emailed the offer over and ask for a return call or acknowledge receipt. Don't get personal. Don't let your wants and needs get in the way of the transaction. If the buyer wants to buy and the seller wants to sell, our job is to put it together. Don't be one of those agents that go, we've never done it like that before. So what? Doesn't mean it can't be done. Don't take it personal. It's a negotiation, working with the listing agent. Never challenge the listing agent. I mean, don't question their comps. If you, you know, don't, especially if there's multiple offers. If there's no other offers, who cares? but be very, very careful questioning their comps because you're creating an adversary from the start. Don't let the other agent negotiate you. You know, a lot of times agents will start, 280,000, are you kidding? This is 300,000, it's the lowest price in the neighborhood, blah, 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 they start berating you. Don't let them do that. Go ahead, listen, this is between the buyer and the seller. This is what the buyer told me to offer. Just present it. You know, you do your job, I'll do mine, but don't like sit there and yell at me. Uh, don't let the deal die. Keep the negotiations alive, right? Give me something. Give me $50. Just give me something to go back with. And you just keep going back and forth and back and forth and put it together. Re always return calls. Be nice. Work together. You have a common goal, and that is the buyer wants to buy and the seller wants to sell. Your job is to make it happen. Because sometimes you win, and sometimes you what? You learn. You learn but you never lose unless you give up, okay? Oh, any questions or thoughts? Okay, that two hour class was two hours. So much for trying to get it done in an hour. I apologize. I wanted it sooner, but those of you guys that got MCE, you needed to be here for two hours anyway. All right, so let's do the drawing. Is there any questions? Okay, good. Well. Leanne Thomas, she gets the gift card. Or wait, was it? Or she wants that. What, okay, what if she wants this? Well, here, give me somebody else. We're gonna give here. Leanne, you get your pick of the first, the gift card of this, and then the second person gets the remaining. Michael Coburn, no, um, Charlotte Case, Charlotte Case. She just walked out. All right, so. Yeah, we, I would normally say that, but she just walked out. All right, guys, thank you very much for attending the class. I hope you enjoyed this. That was a mouthful trying to get that all out. I have a lot more that I could talk about for, throughout that class, but I had to speed it up. So if uh, you're a brand new agent or we're in the business less than five years, you ought to come to our Fast Start training program where we'll cover all that in much more detail. Have a great day, and remember, you're great where you are, you're just too good to stay there. See y'all. Wait, 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 wait. I got it.